Good morning. If you would take your Bibles and open them up with me to Exodus 21. We have already gone through the Decalogue or what we call the Ten Commandments. And we've seen how the Ten Commandments are directly related to how Jesus summed up the whole Bible. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And as we saw, the first four commands are focused vertically on loving God. The outgrowth of that is the last six commands, which are horizontal, having to do with loving your neighbor. For the next several chapters, starting with chapter 21, we're going to see various laws or ordinances that were focused more specifically on loving your neighbor. Um, more detailed accounts of individual situations. Remember, when Jethro came, <clears throat> excuse me, when Jethro came and told Moses that he would need to get some help, he would need to um, delegate some authority to other, uh, other people. Remember, there was judges that he placed over thousands and hundreds and tens, so if you'll remember that. These judges needed some standard to go by, and so God is laying it out. He laid it out with the Decalogue, which is the moral law. Now they're going to be more specific about different situations, and we're going to see some of those uh, ordinances and judgments that make perfect sense. Some of them make us scratch our heads a little bit, but we're going to try to do our best to go through and understand why God has given these ordinances. One thing that we can say uh, over and above, uh, first, a caveat of being careful. What we don't want to do is read how we see things in the 21st century into how they saw things uh, back then. Okay, so uh, especially when we're talking about slavery, we'll get into that. And as you read it, I hope you will understand that slavery um, isn't, hasn't always been the way we picture slavery, um, you know, what happened in our country. And so slavery has been used throughout the world, throughout history. And we'll, uh, there are some uh, good uses of slavery and some uh, abusive. Uh, and it, of course, human nature is fallen, so it tends toward abuse. And so as we, as we dive into uh, chapter 21, what we're going to see overall is a value for life, regardless of the life situation. So it doesn't matter whether you're wealthy or a slave, you have a voice and you um, have value because God made you. And that means whether you're an Israelite or whether you're not an Israelite, there's still, um, it's a human life. And so as you read chapter 21, keep this in mind, the value of life. And in different situations, life gets to be kind of sticky sometimes. So God's laying out certain judgments that people could look to and know how to fix uh, bad situations. So before we dive in, uh, read it yourself. Then we'll talk after we pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for right and wrong. And Father, I am so thankful that I don't have to come up with what is right and what is wrong, but right and wrong are based on your character. But Father, as we're going to see in, in the preceding chapters, that life gets messy. And in these messy situations, you are a God of order, and you give order even in the middle of this fallen world. For that, we are eternally thankful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we begin um, with, and I think it's very interesting that it begins with, Slavery. It says, now these are the ordinances which 
you are to set before the Israelites. He's God's telling Moses. If you buy a Hebrew slave, so one of your countrymen is a slave. Now remember back the history with Moses. Moses was a Hebrew, yet when he was a baby, he was brought into Pharaoh's household. All of his countrymen were slaves to the Egyptians. And remember, when Moses is about 40 years old, he sees a, a taskmaster beating a Hebrew slave. And what does Moses do? Moses uh, kills the taskmaster, ma taskmaster and because he knows that, that something is wrong in that situation. Apparently, this taskmaster master is about to kill the Hebrew and in Moses's mind and of course he's right was not the way to go about it so he kills the Egyptian now God has brought them out of slavery by his mighty hand and I, I he's already given his Decalogue here, when the last six commands are about loving your neighbor. And there's a reality here that slavery is going to be part of every society. Whether, um, whether it's called that or not. Um, the big question about slavery is twofold. Did the person who is the slave did they have a choice in the slavery, or was this slavery forced on them? Much of, of what, um, you know, you've heard of being shanghai in China. That's when you, you got on a boat and they kidnapped you and sold you into slavery. Much of that happened with Africans that were brought here to the United States to be slaves is there was a, a kidnapping. It was no choice of their own. The slavery that is spoken of in the Bible, because sometimes the Bible gets a bad rap about uh, condoning slavery. Slavery is a reality in this world. But like I said, did I have the choice to go into slavery or not? Second big caveat, is my master good or is my master cruel and abusive? See, all this can be, uh, we're, we're called servants or slaves of God. Now, he's brought us in and made us his children, which means he's a great master. But we were born in sin, born under a cruel master, Satan. And remember, we did not have any choice to be under this cruel master. We were born because of Adam's sin under this cruel slave master Satan. But then Jesus comes along, a good master, who lays down his life for us. But he gives us the opportunity to choose whether we want to be his servant, his slave. And so, if we only think of slavery as bad and not good, we're going to miss the understanding of slavery being a both a spiritual reality and a physical reality. Um, it says, if you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve for six years, but on the seventh year he shall go out as a free man without payment. So in Hebrew history, slavery was mostly a mutual arrangement. And mostly it was limited in its duration, and it was highly regulated. We're going to see that. So it wasn't anybody being forced into this, except by economic, um, sometimes we can see extreme poverty uh, would cause somebody to be sold into slavery. Leviticus 25 talks about this. and uh, Sometimes they would, uh, we're going to see in this chapter, sell their daughter into slavery, and we'll talk more about that when we get to that in our present text. Um, for bankruptcy, if I was indebted and couldn't pay my debtors off, I would uh, enslave myself, sell my labor. Um, sometimes if I was a thief and I stole and I got caught and I had to pay restitution, but I had no, no where 
wherewithal to pay restitution, then I would have to sell my own labor. I would have to sell myself. But in Hebrew understanding, uh, after six years, on the seventh year, I was set free regardless. So any type of slavery here was seen to be temporary. Now, it gives some, it says if he goes alone and he comes out alone, so however you came into the slavery situation, you go out the same way. If I came in all by myself, I'm going to go out all by myself. If I came in with a wife, I'm going to go out with a wife. If I came in with a wife and children, I would go out with a wife and children. However, he states here very clearly, if I'm enslaved and my master gives me a wife, well, he's not forcing me to have that wife. And I, I understand it, it's my choice. So I, I marry uh, this person. Maybe we have children. And then it goes on to say, well, uh, this wife was a servant also, more than likely, and she can't just marry me and at the end of seven years we all go free. No, she had to fulfill her obligation uh, or be redeemed. And remember, redeemed means to be bought out, to pay a ransom, the price to be bought out of slavery. We're going to see that used throughout. So, it, it, it's just, that's what's going on in this present text. Now, um, in verse 5, it says, But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, I love my wife, my children, I will not go out as a free man. Well, obviously, when he got married, he knew this was the stipulation. So, if I could not stand my master or the work environment that I was in, I would not willingly marry someone who my master was giving to me. So this is a whole process not being forced, but of choice. And so he has chosen uh, to marry, and he loves the situation that he's in at the end of seven years. But he must make a choice now. Either leave or remain a perpetual servant in his master's household. Look what it says. If I say I want to stay, then his master shall bring him to God. And so this is a covenant that they're making before God. Um, it says, then he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and shall he shall serve him permanently. Now this isn't motivated by any kind of debt or any kind of obligation. It's motivated by love for his master and respect for his master. Now, this is the idea even that we see of Jesus to the Father. I mean, in, in Philippians 2.7, it says that he took on the form of a bondservant. That bondservant, or doulos here, is this idea of, I chose this. I willingly wanted to be this. Let's read something in Psalm chapter 40. Psalm 40. In Psalm 40, which this whole psalm is messianic, meaning it's, it's prophetically talking about the coming of Messiah. But look at verse 6. It says, Sacrifice and meal offerings you have not desired. My ear you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offerings you have not required. My ear ears you have opened. That's this idea of uh, I have willingly laid down my life. Um, I have chosen to be this slave. When you and I are born again, this is what we're saying. We're saying, hey, I was born. I didn't have any choice serving Satan. Uh, but now God has provided a way for me to be ransomed or redeemed from that slavery into servitude to him. But it has to be my choice. I willingly get to choose to serve God. You can read Romans 1.1, 1, 1, James 1.1, 1, 1, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, 
the first verse of Jude. And all of those are, the, the apostles are describing themselves as bond servants of the Lord. Willing participants. Anytime you see bond servant in the New Testament, it's pointing directly to this idea here in Exodus 21. Now we go from there to verse 7. It says, if a man shall sell his daughter as a female slave, you say, wow, why would someone do that? Why would they sell their daughter into slavery? Well, the custom of the day was that if my daughter was going to get married, I had to have a dowry for her that, that would be given to the family and help them uh, have a start in life. Now, let's say as a uh, father that I am so poor that I do not have the wherewithal to provide any sort of dowry for my daughter. What could be done was when my daughter is at a very young age, I could go to a family that I think is a very good family, influential family, a family that if I waited for my daughter to get older, she would never uh, be betrothed to that family. So here, uh, when she's young, I can sell her into slavery to this family. And it's not the slavery, the payment isn't debt, the payment is marriage. Uh, I can't provide for this, this girl the way that you could. And so I'm saying, let's have an agreement about marriage either for the master or for the master's sons. And when she's a young child, uh, she's going to serve in your household. Um, look what it says. If a man, it says she is not free, not to go free as the male slaves do. It's not the same as just at the end of six years, boom, on the seventh year she's put out. Um, if she is displeasing in the eyes of her master, who betrothed or designated her for himself. So they made an agreement that when she got to the age that she could be married, that she was going to be betrothed to the master. And later on we see either to the master or to the master's son. It says, uh, but if it gets to that point and the master nor the master's son want to fulfill the promise or the covenant that they've made, then they have to redeem her. Then she, he shall let her be redeemed. So she, even if she wants to marry somebody else, that's perfectly fine, but her new husband has to pay the redemption price to buy her out of slavery. It says, he does not have the authority to sell her to a foreign people. Um, that's always the case, okay? But it's laid out here especially for the girls. This is what happened in the life of Joseph that was so wrong, is that the, they took a family member and sold them to a foreign nation. Um, it says, uh, look at verse 10 with me. It says... Um, if he takes her, if, if he takes to himself another woman. So he has promised that he's going to marry this girl as soon as she gets old enough to be married. But he decides before then or in the middle of it that he wants to marry somebody else. Uh, what he cannot do is hurt her. Can't break the covenant that he's made. And here it says he may not reduce her food, or really the, the, a better translation is her meat, meaning he can't, uh, she was treated as one of the family. She was not treated as a slave. She wasn't to be downgraded with her food or her clothing or her conjugal rights. Now, this doesn't mean that the Jewish masters could could have physical relations with their slaves. That's not what this is talking about. I think the King James says the duty of marriage, which is a better idea. What, what's going on here is if, if I have brought this girl into my household and promised her that when she got old enough 
to be married that she would marry me and I decide to marry somebody else, I can't just keep her in my household and never allow her to get married. I, I don't have that kind of power. So that's the idea here, not this idea of multiple uh, wives in one family. God is never, uh, it, it's never prescriptive in the Bible. It is descriptive, some of uh, God's people having more than one wife, but if you look at the history of it, it never turns out well. God's plan is one man, one woman for life unless one of the mates die, and then they're free to marry someone else. This is not talking about a master being able to sexually abuse uh, slaves. It's not what it's talking about. Verse 11, if he will not do these things, uh, these three things for her, then she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. Um, so what's being lost here is if she wants to marry somebody else and, and this person wants to redeem her and he says no, he can't say no because what he's going to lose is she's going to be able to go out without any redemptive price. So that's the idea. We go from there into personal injury. And in verse 12, it, verse 12, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, and 22 all give us different scenarios about personal injury. Um, first, it says in verse 12, He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. This isn't new. First time we heard about this was in Genesis 9, 6. We, you can also go all the way to Romans 13, verses 3 and 4, where it talks about government wielding the sword for capital punishment. So all these things are biblical. You can study them on your own. It says verse 13, but there's some caveats in here. This is exactly what's talked about in chapter 20 uh, in the Decalogue as murder. Murder is not the same as uh, manslaughter. Uh, murder is not an accident. Even uh, a crime of passion where we're fighting and something happens. Uh, or, or just mere neglect. It's premeditated, I want to kill you, and I go do it. What we saw happen with Cain and Abel. Look what it says. But if, but if he did not lie and wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint you a place to which he may flee. Okay, so this means, I, I wasn't premeditated wanting to kill this person. It's just the way that it kind of worked. Um, God provided what's called a city of refuge, a place to flee. You can read about this in Numbers 25 or in Joshua chapter 20. And uh, that way it doesn't cause problems in the individual community. The person that committed the manslaughter would have to go away. And so there wouldn't be this wound being opened up every day. Um, look at verse 14. If, however, a man acts presumptuously toward his neighbor so as to kill him craftily, you are to take him even from my altar that he may die. Um, what You say, what's it talking about here, the altar? Well, there was a custom in those days, and Israel adopted it, that if you went to a religious altar and threw yourself on the corners, what's called the horns of the altar, you can read about this in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 28, that you could lay yourself at the mercy of the altar. Um, kind of almost the same thing that we see in Western movies, where... The, the, posse is, you know, the posse is coming after the criminal, and the criminal runs into a church, and as long as he's in the church, they're not going to shoot up the church. Uh, so the idea here is nobody's really listening to me. This is to try to get away from vigilante justice, and that uh, 
you could throw yourselves on the horns of it. Somebody's going to come and listen to you. But uh, here it's saying, if you've committed first degree murder, I don't care if you're at the altar hanging on to the corners, you're going to, you're going to have, you're going to die. Verse 15, he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely uh, be put to death. Um, I, I think it's interesting as we're talking about murder here, before we get to the parent thing, I forgot this. If you remember when Cain killed Abel, uh, when God comes to Cain, God says the blood of your brother is crying out from the ground. Um, in Numbers chapter 35, verses 31 through 34, it talks about that a murderer pollutes the earth, the ground. And so that if we allow murderers to not be punished, it's going to affect everybody. That's the idea. And I think that's a very interesting point when we think about the millions of babies that are murdered every year. I mean, if, if Abel's body cried out to God, what does the scream sound like of all the people murdered in our country that aren't being brought to justice? Just a thought. It's important that children have respect for their parents. Um, they are the ultimate authority in the child's life. It says, he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Now, we know that in these cases, you can read Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21, that, that give a little more information here. And the more information goes like this. They, they couldn't just kill their son or daughter. Uh, it had to be brought before uh, the authorities and they walked through the process together. So this wasn't an absolute uh, power. Uh, matter of fact, in history, it shows that very little of this actually happened. It just uh, was a process that had to be walked through. Uh, verse 16, he who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he is found in his possession, shall be put to death. It's fairly clear. He who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Um, I, ho I hope you see uh, the authority of parents and how God wants the authority structure to be respected. Remember, uh, even in the deck law, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land with which the Lord your God gives you. So it's directly related to what is written here. Um, verse 18. If, if men have a quarrel, so we're fighting, and one strikes the other with a stone or even with his fist, and he does not die, but, but he's injured, but, but he remains in bed, meaning he's injured, uh, maybe for the rest of his life, maybe just for a short time. It says if he gets up and walks around outside on his staff, meaning he's just limping, then he who struck him shall go unpunished. But he shall only pay for his loss of time, and he shall take care of him until he is completely healed. So the idea is, if we're fighting and one of us gets injured, I'm going. if I'm out of work and can't provide for my family, you're going to have to step in and do this. This is supposed to be a deterrent so that people will not handle their quarrels in a physical way. Go before the judge, have them mediate and arbitrate, arbitrate between uh, the two sides. Um, enough said. Look at verse 20. If a man strikes his male or female slave with a rod and he dies at his hand, he shall be punished. This was, this was revolutionary at the time. That a slave had rights? Yes, this slave is a person that God made. And therefore, is not property. For most people, the slave was seen as property, and I can do with my property what I want. If I want to kill my property, I can. Not so here. 
But then it gives this interesting caveat here. It says, if, however, he survives a day or two, no vengeance shall be taken, for he is his property. Okay, so then you're like, well, this is kind of schizophrenic. Well, the idea here is if a slave is unruly, sometimes it's going to take some corporal punishment to get the slave back in line. And the thought here is that if I am uh, punishing a slave to get them to submit to my authority, um, I'm trying to discipline him so that he will do what is right. And if he lives for two or three days, it really shows the intent that I wasn't trying to kill him. I didn't have murderous thoughts. If I'd had murderous thoughts, I would have killed him right then. But if he lives two or three days, it shows that I really didn't want to kill him. I was just, it got out of hand in the way I was disciplining him. So you say, well, you, you may not like that, but that's what God laid out. Verse 22, if men struggle with each other and strike a woman who is pregnant so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judge decides. So if we're in an argument and my wife's trying to stop us and we push her out of the way and she gives birth prematurely, I have the choice as the injured person, my wife was injured, to go take it to court. And then the court will decide what payment needs to be made, if any. Verse 23, but if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint a penalty. Okay, so let's say the baby dies. Uh, now, this is what's called lex talionis. Um, sometimes we call it eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is where this, that statement comes from. A life for a life. If, if I take a life, my life should be given. Now we've already shown that they are, there is a, a system set in place of redemption where uh, life for a life, there, if it was manslaughter, if it was not, premeditated murder, there was a way to pay a price to redeem my life. Um, eye for an eye. If I've hurt somebody's eye, they should take out my eyes. Uh, tooth for tooth, knock out my tooth, I'm going to knock out your tooth. Uh, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Meaning, the, you've heard this saying, the, the punishment should fit the crime. That's where the, that thought came from. If I knock out your tooth, I can't, as the flesh wants to, I can't kill you. So it goes both ways. Um, verse 26, if a man strikes the eye of his male or female slave and destroys it, he shall, <clears throat> he shall let him go on account of his eye. And if he knocks out a tooth of his male or female slave, he shall let him go on account of the tooth. This is, again... What we talked about is sometimes a master would discipline his slave. But there's value from God in this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this slave. So that I would be very careful not to go too far in uh, punishing my slave because if I, if I punished their eye or injured them permanently with a tooth or an eye, they got their freedom. Um, verse 28, if a, verses 28 to the end are really talking about now my property of not slaves, but animals. And you're going to see here that human life is more important than the life of an animal. So uh, it says, if a man, uh, if an ox gores a man or woman, so the horns on, you know, I guess we all know what goring is. Uh, sticks his horn in you and, and, and pierces you. Um, the ox shall surely be stoned and its flesh shall not be eaten. So this animal is out of control and has killed a person. And so the animal is put to death and we can't eat the flesh. But the owner of the ox shall not be punished. 
If, however, the oxen, the ox was previously in the habit of goring and its owner had been warned. Well, obviously he did, he had gored somebody, but they didn't die. And people had said, you need to get that animal under control, but I, I ignored it. Yet he does not confine it and it kills a man or a woman. Then the ox shall be stoned and the owner shall also be put to death because it's negligence on my part. If a ransom is demanded of him, then he shall give for the redemption of his life, whatever is demanded of him. So, again, this idea is the owner more than likely was never put to death, but it, it was like what happens in civil court. There could be a demand, a monetary payment that would uh, suffice. It says, verse 31, Whether it gores a son or a daughter, it shall be done to him according to the same rule. If the ox gores a male or a female servant, the owner shall give his or her master 30 shekels of silver and the ox shall be stoned. Again, showing that even slaves have, uh, have value before God. God doesn't see them as less than human. And I think that in human history, where slavery has gotten... Uh, to be abusive on a whole is when they're seen as less than human. Uh, people are made in the image of God, and it doesn't matter in, in what area of life or circumstance that finds them in. I think this is interesting that the price paid for a slave uh, was 30 shekels of silver, and in Matthew 26, 15, it's the very same price that the religious leaders paid Judas for, for betraying Jesus. And this idea of be very careful on how you think about slavery because Jesus willingly placed himself in servitude. Verse 33, If a man opens a pit or digs a pit and does not cover it over. Now, many times they would dig pits to, in, in, for like storing grain. Uh, they didn't have silos, so they would dig a hole. Sometimes they would dig a hole as a trap for animals. Well, you couldn't just set a trap for animals and not mark it out so that people knew what was there. Look what it says. It says, if a man opens a pit or digs a pit and does not cover it over and an oxen or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restitution. He shall give money to its owner, and the dead animal shall become his. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm having to pay. A donkey falls into the pit that I left. I went to lunch and left it open. The donkey fell in it and got killed. I would have to pay the payment. Obviously, a live donkey costs more than a dead donkey. So I would have to pay the price of a live donkey, but I would only get the dead donkey. There it is. 35. If one man's oxen hurts another so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the price equally. And also they shall divide the dead ox. So I think this is an interesting caveat later on when we see Solomon, it talks about Solomon's wisdom. This idea is that if, if my uh, cow uh, hurts your cow and kills it, then we have to sell my cow. So we sell the live cow and the dead cow, and then we split the proceeds. Um, either with the dead cow, with the meat. And I think it's interesting uh, when... Solomon, uh, two prostitutes came before Solomon and one of the prostitutes fell asleep and rolled over and killed her baby. And the other, the other prostitute had a baby and so the one prostitute that had killed her baby went over and swapped her dead baby and took the other uh, lady's baby while she was asleep. And now they're in an argument, as you might well ascertain. They came to Solomon, and Solomon, in his wisdom, uses this for the children. 
He says, oh, all we'll do is take the live child and split the child in half and we'll give half of it to each of you. Well, one woman said, fine. The other woman said, oh, no, 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 it's fine. Let her have, have the baby. And then Solomon knew that that was the mother because she loved the, the baby. And so uh, interesting things uh, to walk through. Uh, verse 36, or if it is known that the ox was previously in the habit of goring, yet its owner had not confined, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead animal shall become his. Now, I don't think, in, in my mind, this is not boring to go through. This is understanding the society that they were in, but also understanding the laws that we have today and where uh, their inception was from. Much talk in our culture today about slavery. And I think you need to be very, very careful in how you see slavery. And again, I'm going to remind you of these two aspects as you think about slavery. Uh, did the person who is a slave, did they have a choice in slavery or were they forced into slavery? Second, is the master a good master or is the master abusive? Because remember, Spiritually speaking, every one of us are born slaves. We're born without choice as slaves to Satan and the world system in our own fleshly nature. And they're abusive. But yet Jesus comes and he initiates through his own sacrifice, through his own serving of his father, lays down his life to provide a way, a price, a ransom, to ransom us. To freedom. The ransom uh, is paid not to Satan, but to God the Father who is ultimately in control. Now, God never forces any of us into this new servanthood. You have a choice and I have a choice. Uh, but if we choose, we are surrendering control of our lives to him. But he's a good good master. Father, we thank you for your love for us, that you demonstrated your love for us even when we were yet sinners. You sent your son to die for us. And so, Father, may we be good servants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.